Establishing connection to your science night. Please stand by. Welcome back to another edition of the Science Night Podcast. My name is James, and with me, as always, is Steffi. Hi. And Jason. Hello. Tonight, we have dishwasher discourse, wandering water, and an expansive exoplanet. We got a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. Our first story could be one of the most controversial items we've ever covered on this show. But I think we got to create a brave space here and talk about these hot button issues. Or what are we doing as a science communication and information podcast? So before we get into the actual story, I think Team Science Night has to have this discussion, right? So how do we load a dishwasher? So you try for years to blow the dishwasher because you want to be a good partner in your house and share duties, but then it never works because there's always fights and then you just give up. That's and then one someone way. else does it. Yeah. No, see, I disagree. I feel like you you try to share the responsibility for years until one day you force the other to quit. Oh. Because there's no point anymore. <laughs> mm, mm. Or you know, there's the other tactic where there is the loading, which happens however it happens. The unloading. See, the, I think what this article skims over is the unloading. Because usually what happens is like you just, oh, I didn't realize it was clean. I thought it was still dirty. That's why I didn't do anything about it. Yeah. Fun time. No, that's, that's the problem in my house, right? We have two teenage boys who refuse to coordinate whose turn it is to empty the dishwasher. Mm-hmm. Because I can't rely on them. Sorry, we can't rely on them to load the dishwasher. I also can't rely on anybody else to load the dishwasher properly. So yeah. that's a that this sounds like a me problem, though. It's a me problem. <laughs> You've just become the dad of the Science Night podcast. Like we're just, micromanaging dishwashers. Just now? I think so. Well, it, it, it was definitely it was definitely <laughs> on your lamenting of the uh, of the safety squeeze too. Yeah, right. I mean, I think when I when I maligned baseball as we know mm-hmm. it now that's when i became the dad of this podcast yeah but now i just become the uh the dad who won't let anyone load the dishwasher on the podcast mm-hmm. it sounds to me like uh steph and i might have some problems yeah i'm just not gonna do it it's i don't see a problem you no, obviously love point. loading the dishwasher no 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 i, don't I obviously love... cannot do it <laughs> Let me be clear. I don't love loading the dishwasher. I hate the way others load the dishwasher. And that's a very mm-hmm. different thing, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. You know right. You know how we can solve this? How's that? We can put some radionuclides in a dishwasher and throw it into a PET scan. Okay. Yes. Sounds like something that might have been done. So, a team at the University of Birmingham used a technique called positron emission particle tracking that could track radioactive tracers that were injected into the water of a dishwasher to see how water moves around during a normal wash cycle. And here's some of the highlights of what they found. Putting dishes around the center in a circle allows for optimal flow, but you can put like way less dishes in there. What are they thinking with this one? Right. And the, the guides are not set up for you to, to right. arrange no, your dishes exactly. that way. Right. Yeah. So like this, this goes against physics. <laughs> it goes against nature. <laughs> yes. What are they getting on? Anyway, I'm so, I'm so glad we broke off from these Brits. Anyway, put tall items toward the outside. I mean, that seems obvious. And here's the thing that is going to get, like, everyone heated. It doesn't matter the direction in which you place your utensils into the basket. And pre-rinsing is not necessary. Man, the world was triggered when they heard that you can just put utensils in however you want to. And the great debate of pre-rinsing versus not pre-rinsing is now apparently settled by radioactive water. Listen, I appreciate that they made a definitive statement about which direction the the utensils need to be placed in the basket. 
and that you know basically they came to the conclusion that it doesn't matter but they failed to account for one very important variable and that is if you place your utensils down in the basket you can potentially break the bottom of that basket mm. like as someone who had a dishwasher oh. that was hanging on for way longer than it should have Every time we placed silverware into the basket, it would slide through the bottom because someone thought it was a good idea to always put the knives face down. Now, I am willing to risk the safety issue of having a knife facing up as long as it's toward the back of the dishwasher if it will remain possible for me to continue to use that basket for longer, if it doesn't cut the little strips out of the bottom of that basket because that is like way worse than stabbing oneself on a knife i have an aside story right now oh, for loading so the happy. dishwasher okay so my friend incorrectly cut a box open with a scissors instead of a box cutter and that was like a safety violation at the lab that i worked at wow. so the re remediation of that was like let's train people how to open things with the correct like utensils, how how to handle things. So they made them watch a safety video on how to load a dishwasher and put the knives down. <laughs> oh, right. man. If Jason you versus OSHA. <laughs> if you don't care about your dishwasher, go for it. If you care about the longevity of your dishwasher, then don't place the knives face down in the basket. They will cut the little plastic pieces out of the bottom, and then you're going to end up with knives inside the main part of the of the dishwasher not just, just in the utensil around. basket yeah i know you don't want that talk about unsafe yeah <laughs> here's the move though you gotta get you gotta get one of those three-story dishwashers where you oh put yeah the knives all the way on the top just lay them down flat and it doesn't matter that's where i put all of my knives in that top rack oh because well, i got that be... hurricane force water just going around I don't disagree with you, but let me be clear i'm not talking about chef's knives right those should always be washed by hand because you don't want to dull the blade with, you know, the detergents and uh, um, the excessive washing that's going to happen in the dishwasher compared to what you can do by washing it by hand in the sink. That said, I'm talking about steak knives, sure. really, right? Yeah. Steak yeah. knives, don't put those face down. Don't do it. Stab yourself if you have to, but trust me, it's oh worth not gosh. having to look for another basket. It's worth it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Do we do we think that this article is actually like a plant by the dishwashing industry so that the baskets wear out quicker and people have to buy more dishwashers? It's big okay. whirlpool right here. Yep. Yeah. So I think I read that this study was somewhat funded by Bosch. It definitely like those was. Yeah. Super expensive dishwashers. So I think the thing is you need to spend a lot of money on a super fancy dishwasher and mm -hmm. then maybe your basket doesn't break. Yeah, and also that's what eliminates the need for pre-rinsing. Just <laughs> let just let the detergent and the water created by Bosch do the work for you. Do you think also that maybe the fact that they had radioactive water was making the dishes a little cleaner than normal? Can I talk about that? Yes. yes. Okay. Do you want to? I'll, I'll talk about how they T measured this. Is that, that is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So they put a tracer in there. So I think a lot of maybe some people are familiar with medical isotope tracers that you get for like scans and things like that. So this is actually like larger particles that they suspend in there um, that are radioactive. Um, so what happens is they undergo undergo beta decay of these tracers while it's suspended in the water. And so what happens then is it emits that beta um, which is a positron it annihilates an electron because they're antiparticles um, then releases two gamma photons so two gamma rays are emitted from that one event and then they have a series of detectors that are mounted around and they measure all these photons that are coming all these gamma rays that are interacting with the detectors and actually give off the light that they measure that light and so what they're actually looking at is I mentioned there's two photons, two gamma rays that are emitted 180 degrees from each other. And if I'm just going in the weeds here, you can just be like, no, stop. Continue going on. On. Keep weeds. going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they're emitted 180 degrees from each other. And so you know exactly when those gamma rays hit those two, those two um, scintillation cameras, what they call them, the detectors. And then you measure them 
the coincidence of those events being measured at the same time. Um, and then they can use that to calculate where it was emitted from, like the incident radiation, where it came from and things like that. Mm -hmm. And all of this is useful to understand that if you put uh, plates that are soiled with like egg yolks around the periphery, yeah. Yeah. where the where the water um, turbulence is lower and it allows, I believe the author said it allows the uh, proteins to swell with water and then get flushed out. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, that was, that, that was that's like, I is. never thought I would read something like that in a, in a science either. article. I right. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know what I love about this story? That one, we have some actual guidelines that are rooted in in science. That's pretty cool. But two, this started as someone's argument over how to load a dishwasher, right? Yeah, it absolutely and did. That is what I think uh, makes me proud to be a scientist right there. I'll link, I'll definitely, I mean, I'll definitely link to this story on the show notes, but Listeners, go and take a look at the infographic they've created for this because it is like it is beautiful. It's good. It is wonderful. It is it is what you know, science informatics, you should be fighting to create something as excellent as this. This is like the hallmark of science communication and it will not get better, so we should just stop trying. Like this is ready to go <laughs> in the Smithsonian, right next to the Julia Child's kitchen, I think. In Probably life. right in the Julia Child's kitchen. Why not? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what do you think Julie would think about this? She didn't wash her own dishes. She had people for yeah. that. She had a whole team of people. What are we talking about? She never loaded a dishwasher. That's not <laughs> how they do it in the French style. That was my <laughs> Julia voice. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Well, Talking about water and how it's just like spraying around these uh, dishwashers. Why don't we move on to our next story? It's easy to look over the vast oceans that cover most of the planet and think, that's all just water. But that's not the case. Earth's oceans are made up of unique patches of water with similar salt contact, chemical makeup, and temperature that are separated and mixed by a system of currents. Learning about how these patches are connected and mixed can help scientists understand all sorts of things about the ocean, from migration patterns of marine life to the distribution of heat and nutrients around the globe. But one thing has been a mystery until very recently. You see, there's been observed patches of water around the equator and the Indian and Pacific Oceans, but the Atlantic equatorial water has remained elusive as scientists look everywhere under couches and local swimming pools even in the indian and pacific oceans and the last statement is true they actually looked for the atlantic equatorial water in other oceans but recently thanks to data collected by a bunch of robots scattered around the world's oceans called the argo program which i'm sure is not something we need to be concerned about they found the atlantic equatorial water and it turns out it was located along the equator in the atlantic ocean between the north atlantic and south atlantic water always the last place you look at it so what we think about this pesky atlantic equatorial water just like hanging out in plain sight i find it absolutely thrilling that scientists went on a search for water within water and couldn't find the water within the water, water right? Water everywhere, right? Right. I love that. And I love for them that they were able to finally identify it. But I think maybe the best part of the uh, of this story was the last sentence, which which sums it all up. And it says, now that the water mass has been identified, it will give scientists a better understanding of the ocean's mixing processes, which are vital to the ocean's transport of heat, oxygen, and nutrients around the globe. Yes, yes. very important. However, that was missed in the entire story that was really just a, a recounting of a search for water within water. It was like a and who done it. It was. Right. Where did it yeah. go? Right. Yeah. It was it was scintillating. Do you think yeah. this has already been optioned? It'll turn into a new franchise in Hollywood. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I 
certainly the title of this story was that there was a missing blob of water. So mm-hmm. perhaps that's the uh, that's the Hollywood tie in yeah. right there. Ooh, should right? we option it? Hold on. We had that plaque idea that is probably going to make us millions of dollars. Maybe we got Just option movies, too. Yeah. Add this yeah. to it. I like Go it. Go fund us to create the the uh, oceanographic water patch extended universe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I, also, were we a little concerned how they just kind of glanced over the fact that we got a bunch of self-sustaining robot drones all over the world's oceans? The Argo program? Yeah, let's not even go there. <laughs> I feel like that's just a given now. Sure. So you're going to be mon- we're monitoring everything, including the the water. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's Different going on waters. in the water, around the water? Yeah, I, I that was a great point that they kind of put it at the end, the significance of this finding. So I got it kind of early on because when I was reading this, I'm like, this sounds this sounds a lot like an interchange in stability in plasma physics. Uh, where That's you get where late. you and I part company, <laughs> Steph. Whoa. Like I didn't think that at all. I can't where believe you... that you've talked about plasma physics. That's amazing. I, know. I I told you I bring everything to back to you know fusion and plasmas, but you can get this sense and they they talk about it in the water where you have different temperatures and salinity in this case or or densities in our case which kind of makes it a different material and it interacts mm-hmm. with these these layers that interact with each other differently. And so the interchange instability is when you have a gradient of these characteristics in a plasma, which is pressure, which is temperature and density. And then you get this mixing and it kind of goes unstable. We also get this too, and this goes back to when they talk about understanding transport of heat, oxygen, and nutrients in, in the in the water too. You see this in other medium as well, um, where you can get different layers can interact differently and you can get, you know, instabilities that lead to turbulence that kind of either block transport of these nutrients in oxygen or in, in, in plasma physics, it's blocking particle transport, or you can actually make it flow. Mm-hmm. And that's like a knob you can turn for different, different aspects. And so, um, the other thing I noticed too was there was when I saw clicked on the article, it was like related story, Gulf Stream weakening now 99% yeah. certain and ramifications will be global. I couldn't even click on it. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> We're all gonna die. It's sure. gonna be 90, it's 99 percent certain. I don't know. 99% I mean, certain that the day after tomorrow yeah. uh, we'll have the, that big tidal wave. The day after tomorrow is today. Ooh, that's a good that's point. A sequel. I don't want to. I don't want to question anyone's authority here. But do you think maybe that the the jet stream is weakening because maybe they've been unable to detect the water changes in the water? Right. I mean, they had such a hard time finding this water within the water. Why is it not possible that they're just having trouble now finding the jet stream water within the ocean? Is a, uh, I, I feel like I am not being pedantic by just correcting you lightly and say it's the Gulf Stream, not the Jet Stream. Oh, that's what I meant. Gulf Stream. If they <laughs> found the Jet Stream in the water, then we got big old problems. It's, it's the day after. That's tomorrow, right. It then. is. No, you're totally right. That's awesome. Yes, yeah. the Gulf Stream. Gulf Stream. Right. The my point is still there, though. It is right? still there, but it I is. just right. you know. Yeah. No, you're right. I, you're I heard. Right. I heard like, the emails being created. Listen, you should, uh, I exposed my neck. You should put your heel on it right there for a second and let me know what I got wrong. That said, I yes. still wonder, Point right? Maybe, still stands. Maybe they're just having trouble detecting water within water again. Maybe. But we got now, now we got all these robots in the water. Who knows? How, what wait, if wait, did we you use say the robot? I did, did say robot. Yes. Nice. I, I used the uh, Professor Zoidberg. Robot pronunciation. For I Futurama. loved it. I love it. I love it. But hold on, can we not use the robots to create new streams of of current? I mean, they got propellers, probably right. Just mass them all and have them turn them on into direction. And water's going to move that way. That's just how science works, right, Steffi? Okay, so this is where I throw my hands up and say geoengineering. There's a lot going on. And I feel like there's a lot happening. A lot is happening fast because we're all 
trying to do what we can to combat climate change, but then maybe we don't have the biggest understanding of the big picture of how all the ecosystems are dependent, mm -hmm. interact with each other. That's just my throwing my hands up in the air, being like, yeah. I don't know what's going on. But I didn't so, hear no, so I think we should also inject a lot of money into this robot plan I just had. Yeah, I didn't hear no robots. either. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna submit uh, this and staple my CV to it to NIH, and we'll probably get hundred percent, hundred percent funded. They're gonna be like, "Why did you send it to us and not NSF?" Also, how did you staple a say, CV? Like, how, how did you, you staple NIH? a CV to an MP3? <laughs> like, that's the more impressive thing. Plasma. Yeah, it's, fu it's fusion, really. Is all yeah, it is. we've fused <laughs> we've fused a piece of paper to an MP3 format and sent it to the wrong organization. <laughs> I I guess the big takeaway is. Why are we looking in the Indian Ocean for the Atlantic Equatorial Waters? What did they think was going to happen? Did they? I got nothing. If did you they... can't find it in the Atlantic, doesn't it seem reasonable you might look for the water you can't find in water in another body of water? Sure. I mean, come on. It's yeah. the next were... logical step. Yeah. How are they going to prove it, though? Were they just looking for water that had like a mid-Atlantic accent? Like, uh, yes. Like, like sounded like Fraser Crane? That's right. That's right. That's probably what the robots They're are going to go up. down the ocean. Yeah, yeah 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 well i think we should lose our curiosity with this story and move to a message from another podcast that i think you will enjoy hi fancy folks welcome to lux sci where we make science fun approachable and most of all fancy i'm dr lex former microbiologist current global health consultant and enthusiast of all the finer things in life. I'm often joined here by my husband, electrical engineer, inventor, and our audio engineer, Dr. Demos. In this podcast, we take listeners on a journey into the microscopic worlds of luxury items and unravel the fascinating intersection of science and opulence. From how bubbles form in champagne to the molecular forces that harden clay in a kiln, to the amount of thrust needed to send a rocket to space. No luxurious topic is safe from our insatiable curiosity. We're on a mission to demystify science and show how it drives the world around us. No PhD or lab coat required. So if you've ever wondered how science and luxury seamlessly intertwine, join us as we uncover untold stories, hidden marvels, and the inner workings of scientific discovery and sophistication. Along the way, we'll also chat with amazing scientists and artisans. So subscribe now and let the exploration begin. Our next story starts with a team of scientists at Penn State University that had a question. Why is James Franklin unable to win a big game against Michigan or Ohio State and still have their job? Like, seriously, it's been ridiculous at Penn State University. What? Anyway, what they actually want to know is, how we find planets around dim, cool stars that don't give off enough light to observe things in their orbit. So they built an instrument that can track the changes created in the velocity when a planet is tugging on these dim stars, which is what I'm calling the family walking near a toy store effect. What they call <laughs> the Doppler radial velocity technique. And they strapped this new instrument to the Hobby Eberly Telescope in West Texas, and they looked for a dim star. They found a red door that is nine times less massive than the sun with the iconic name of LHS 3154 and expected to find a comparatively small planet orbiting it, as is usually the case. However, they found a planet 13 times heavier than the Earth, which has the equally iconic name of LHS 3154B. <laughs> this is making That's astronomers exciting. question how planets like this are formed, but it's also allowing us to ask a pretty interesting question. So this type of star is the most common in our galaxy. And if rocky planets this massive are able to form around these stars, what does that mean for our understanding of the number of potentially habitable planets in our galaxy? 
this is all very exciting and i understand some of it so what do we think about these expansive exoplanets can i, I first talk about it? oh go ahead i just want to say that uh this gets at the age-old question right the name of the star is uh lhs 3154 the name of this exoplanet is lhs 3154 b those mm -hmm. are the known data correct correct so this question about whether or not a star that is nine times smaller than our sun can create a planet that is what was it 15 times larger uh 13 times 13 times yeah. larger than the earth right the question is to be no, or, or not to be that is the question <laughs> Steffi, you probably that have something intelligent to say <laughs> i mean basically that you said it yeah. my talking points um i do like the slider that right? they have in this another all-time mm -hmm. psycom technique yep. where it can show you just how different the size is between like comparing our earth to the sun and then this planet to the the star it's 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 going around right that's that's pretty fascinating mm -hmm. um what the big question is and you can see in that slide are just the very you know just how different how large the planet is compared to the star that's going around is that the way that planets form is um they form from disks that are composed of gas and dust in this in the in the universe these disks then pull together to the dust and then that grows into, you know, larger pebbles and then eventually con it combines, those pebbles combine to form something more solid, like a planetary core. And then once this core is formed, gravity kind of pulls things in to kind of make that larger planet. Um, and then it's growing, it's also, you know, gathering in hydrogen, helium, other, other nutrients or other elements that are in our planets. Um, but it needs a lot of mass to build these planets especially one that big um and so it's the question really is is that star doesn't really it's not big enough to support mm -hmm. a growth of a planet that big so then they're really asking do we know how planets are formed do we understand the fundamental physics behind planet formation and it kind of leads to this case um so i thought that was pretty fascinating the implications from that I yeah. also, because I build instruments, right, <laughs> to measure things, I like the instrumentation. Um, so this one, they use something called Doppler radial velocity technique. And that relies on um, while you going past the toy store, you kind of go back and forth in one direction, right? Um, stars also don't stay stationary. They're going in circles or moving in ellipses, um, things like that. When a planet orbits, that's the that's the way the planet orbits, right? Um, because there's gravitational pull between the two. So any slight movements then impact the light that's being emitted by the star as it goes through that orbit. Um, so if it's moving towards you, being the observer, the light appears more blue. So we call that blue shifted, shorter wavelength. Or when the star is moving away, um, that's when the light is shifted more on towards the red side of the spectrum. So that's what the technique is that they're looking at to kind of see this, this, this event. So I thought what was really interesting about this story, in addition to the things that you brought up, Steffi, which I didn't understand nearly as well as you just explained it, was this idea that um, the way that planets form is well known, right? And it's this idea, you described it, um, of this core accretion sort of method. Um, where, you know, it's basically like a snowball effect, right? Where you have this disc comprised of gas and dust um, that suddenly starts to accumulate larger pieces, you know, tend to to accrete, and then you get a, a core, and then, you know, gra gravitational pull is going to, um, or, you know, gravitation is going to pull uh, different pieces in together and form this bigger planet. But there's a second hypothesis um, that they described as well, another type of uh, planetary formation called gravitational instability, where that gas yeah. and the dust in that disk, instead of growing large, they start out large and become a planet because it collapses, right? So this disk collapses on itself. And that that also fails to explain, that hypothesis also fails to explain how this particular exoplanet could have formed. 
Um, and so it really overturns two generally well supported um, hypotheses about how planets form. And now it kind of upends the apple cart a lot. Um, and that's really cool, right? When you have something that's going to really push a boundary, um, this may seem like a silly story or totally trivial story, um, but this could actually have really long lasting implications for our understanding of how the universe works. Um, mm -hmm. And that's actually, you don't get a whole lot of those kinds of observations um, with regularity, right? Those yeah. kinds of observations are the ones that are of the most sought after. And so that's what makes this story really, really exciting. Yeah. Whenever I find something that doesn't match what our theories are, say it should be, that's when I, like you said, get pretty excited. And I know that if people aren't really used to the scientific method, they can be very uncomfortable about getting a result that's not matching what they think. But really, it just means maybe you don't have every all of the information that you're looking at. Maybe some instrumentation is faulty, or maybe it's something that's new, which yeah. is really exciting. My favorite part of this article was when they pointed out that Superman's homeworld Krypton <laughs> yep. orbits a star that is very similar to LHS 3154. So I don't know why we're not just calling this planet Krypton. Um, like, what's the point of, of like, we got a super dense planet around this red dwarf. What are we doing? Right? Well, how yeah. large was Krypton, right? Was it as it's, large relative to its sun as, uh, I mean... It is fictional, so we DC can just make it that. Yeah, it is. Hey, it's thirteen times uh, more massive than the Earth around a star that's nine times less massive. Says, I don't know who's the guy that created Superman. I don't remember. Okay, I, so that Krypton guy. was approximately one and a half times larger than the Earth until they read this article. Mm -hmm. So that's right. I feel like I just drove us into a kryptonite wall. <laughs> <laughs> my my kryptonite is comic book references in science communication articles. I think that means you've come to the end of another episode, but don't worry. We got more coming your way. So be sure to follow us on social media. If you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at James underscore read three, and you can follow my descent into despair as the entire NFL season just unravels around me, but still go birds, right? Steffi, where can everybody follow you? I have no idea anymore. I mean, you can look for me at Steffi Deem anywhere. Maybe starship in. Yeah. Just walk around your community and look for Steffi. Yeah. Have a conversation. I mean, I am on Instagram, Blue Sky, X, Twitter, Mastodon. Wherever you go, she'll yeah. be there. Yeah. I have something there. Doesn't mean when, I'm active. When the internet needs her more, most, then she'll return. Look to the east. Jason, where can everybody find you? You can find me in my own personal hell on Twitter, at OrganJM. <laughs> Perfect. Well, follow the show at Cyanite Pod and visit our home on the web, Cyanite.com, for links to all our other social media, including our TikTok and YouTube, past episodes, the stories we talk about, the people we talk to, and our merch. I cannot stress enough how cool our new logo is. So go to our merch store and buy all the things. It probably won't get there before the winter holidays, but you'll still be able to wear and you'll look cool. Anyway, there's so much to see and you can see it all at Cyanite.com. We'll be back soon with a new episode, but until then, seriously, like, put your knives point down. I don't care what Jason said. You're going to stab yourself. This is unsafe.